Well, good morning uh, and welcome to Drive Clean Indiana's Clean School Bus webinar. Uh, today's broadcast will be recorded and will be presented on our website uh, for further uh, review. And uh, we're very excited about this uh, upcoming webinar today and uh, it's very exciting. So uh, next slide, please. My name is Carl Lissick and I represent Drive Clean Indiana. Uh, I mean, I am the executive director. And again, we're excited for all of you to be with us today. Next slide, please. We have an incredible webinar today uh, to talk about upcoming US EPA funding. Uh, to do this, we've assembled not only state recognized clean school bus professionals, but nationally recognized experts. And so happy to have them joining us today. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about who we are and what we do. So Drive Clean Indiana uh, is a statewide clean cities coalition. And our goal is uh, to reduce our dependence on imported oil. And we work throughout the state of Indiana as Indiana's only designated clean cities program. Next slide, please. So again, uh, Clean Cities, uh, if, if you are not familiar with Clean Cities, this is a national pro program supported by the U.S. Department of Energy. And the things that we promote are only U.S. EPA and U.S. Department of Energy and IDEM um, uh, approved technologies. Next slide, please. So most recently, Drive Clean Indiana became a statewide coalition as of 2020, and we are um, looking at uh, statewide opportunities. Um, similar to this webinar, we're gonna be hosting numerous webinars and opportunities throughout the state to learn about the upcoming Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and bipartisan infrastructure laws. Next slide, please. So th this is our mission. And again, we're working, we work with all types of fleets, uh, school bus fleets. We work with governmental entities, nonprofits and businesses to help them uh, decarbonize uh, their, their fleets. Next slide, please. How we do this is we do have what is called the Indiana Green Fleet Program. And with the Indiana Green Fleet Program, our goal really is to improve the environmental performance of your fleet. And so currently we work with over 58 municipal, county, school and university members uh, to help them uh, on this journey. And this program is open to any fleet in our entire state. Next slide, please. So some of the advantages of being part of the Indiana Green Fleet Program are educational opportunities similar to this. Uh, we do numerous webinars, uh, workshops, uh, throughout the state and uh, provide a variety of training to help you uh, and your mechanics and your fleet become uh, certified to learn about some of these new technologies, some about uh, of the grants uh, that are available, and then also some of the other incentives and technologies that potentially will help improve the carbon footprint of your fleet. Next slide, please. I think one of the biggest things that we're very proud of is we work with your school to help you get grant ready. And uh, so some of our past successes and uh, uh, Sean Seals will be talking uh, similar of the, some of the successes that we've been involved with. But here in Indiana, we've deployed 16 electric school buses uh, with uh, through the Indiana Volkswagen uh, program. We've also uh, worked on deploying uh, a variety of propane clean school buses. And uh, to date, we've worked with over 191 propane school buses. And this includes the deployment of fueling and infrastructure, um, you know, charging infrastructure. So any questions that you have, please feel free to utilize this as a resource. Next slide, please. So again, what we're talking about today is about um, some of the information that's coming out from US EPA on the bipartisan infrastructure law. So again, uh, just to review what that is, is uh, uh, President Biden had signed one trillion bipartisan infrastructure law on November 15th. Uh, we are anticipating over $5.5 billion of transportation funding to become available throughout the United States. And today we're gonna be focusing just 
literally on Indiana and some of the opportunities to work with us. Next slide, please. First off, to get us started, we wanted to introduce uh, our leading transportation director, uh, director of school transportation from the state of Indiana, Mr. Mike Laraco. Mike? Uh, good morning, everybody, and, and appreciate everybody being here uh, and taking part in this particular seminar. Something for you all to consider as we look at the issues of not only our own uh, environmental concerns, but uh, the shrinking taxpayer dollar that's available. Take advantage of this, uh, put it to use. We were talking a little bit earlier before the but this seminar about how a lot of districts out there, Boston Community Schools, uh, New York Public Schools is talking about trying to go to all electric fleets by the end of the decade. Uh, so this is a movement that's, that's giving you an opportunity and take advantage of it. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, great options here available for you, not only for electric, but propane, other issues that you can take a look at it. So please, uh, take a good hard look, make sure that you're aware of the situations and capabilities and use those resources available to you. I know that we're none of us are grant writers. I surely am not one, but uh, they can help you significantly in getting into that situation where you'll have a better shot at getting the funding that's necessary for your application and your needs. And, uh, and thanks again for allowing me to be here. Michael, thank you for those comments. And uh, again, as Michael said, we are here to be a resource um, for you. And uh, as with Mike, I think uh, there's a lot of information that's going to be presented today. And again, there are no stupid questions. So as we uh, proceed with uh, our next uh, speaker, uh, I just want to make sure that uh, if you have questions at, at the end of the presentation, and if you have questions, please use the chat uh, portion of this uh, webinar and you can see the chat button um, on the side uh, panel uh, it's at it's towards the bottom and so if you would type your question in there if we don't get to your question we will respond to you by email uh, so again we've got a lot of information to cover this morning and we'd like to keep this uh, down uh, this presentation to an hour so uh, in, in lieu of that um, we want to keep uh, moving forward so next slide please so at this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Sean Seals. I think uh, the majority of our school transportation leaders um, have worked with Sean. Uh, they know Sean, and uh, Sean has uh, been a clean diesel leader, uh, not only in our state, but in the nation. And uh, Sean is also the administrator for the most recent Indiana Volkswagen uh, settlement. So Sean, uh, take it away. Thank you, Carl. Um, I need a better picture, by the way. So uh, I appreciate the invitation uh, from Drive Clean Indiana to participate in this webinar. Um, as everyone has said, lots of really, really good information um, is going to be shared uh, here shortly uh, by USCPA. And I just wanted to touch a little bit, and I have literally two slides, to touch a little bit on sort of the, uh, we'll call them the success stories for electric and propane school buses that we have implemented across Indiana. Um, and uh, we will, as, as we kind of walk through these, the, these are the folks that if you're on the, on the edge, you can't decide whether you wanna make this leap to a uh, different, uh, bus than the traditional diesel bus that many are used to. Uh, these would be really, really good folks for you to talk to. So let's go ahead and bounce to the next slide. So what you see in front of you here is uh, the list of electric school bus projects that we have actually implemented through Volkswagen to date. And um, you'll see there are a lot of uh, sort of pretty well spread across the state. We've got some in Northwest Indiana, we've got some Central, we've got some Southern. We do have them pretty well scattered around. Um, through the Volkswagen program, we were uh, typically funding about 75% of an electric school bus. Um, one thing I do want to point out here is, uh, and, and I'll draw attention to one in particular here uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one of those school systems being Monroe County Schools in Bloomington. 
I draw attention to that line because there are things there that might jump out. For example, why is everybody else getting a roughly 300 grand for one bus, but Monroe County got 850 grand for one bus? Well, they actually did three buses. So number of vehicles funded for Monroe County Schools was three. Um, they have a pretty aggressive plan to transition their fleet towards electric. So if if this is a question that you have, um, not only are all these others good options to reach out to and see, you know, kind of what they have heard, what they have learned in their process, uh, Bloomington is definitely a uh, good place to reach out to at Monroe County Schools to see kind of what their thoughts and feelings are. I think it's important to note that uh, there, there is no perfect vehicle out there. Um, so, you know, you might have electric school bus uh, manufacturers. Some, uh, some of these are going to be, you know, fantastic. Some of these are going to have a few bugs. Um, you know, a, an, electric, an electric bus and is really no different than any other bus. There are, there are going to be some hurdles along the way as we transition to new technology. Um, so definitely something to kind of keep in mind. I also wanted to note one other here that could be an, an interesting point of reference for folks. Um, most of the buses that we have funded have been, you know, the traditional full-size uh, electric bus, various manufacturers, but traditionally full-size. But what you'll see is Rensselaer Central Schools, um, once again, funding 75%, their, their project award was only a little over 200 grand they are actually doing a smaller um, bus than the traditional school bus. So if you're looking at doing something maybe a little smaller than the uh, full-size bright yellow bus, uh, Rensselaer might be a good resource for you. I will note that some of these projects are complete, some of these are underway. So with that, we will transition to the next slide. Propane has been a uh, pretty consistent um, direction for Indiana schools, top to bottom. Um, you, you know, you can tell just looking at this at this slide, we've got school systems all across the state that have been making the transition from diesel to propane. They have all uh, been very, uh, I would say, very happy with the transition they've made. I mean, we're we are talking about a, a total of a total of 191 propane buses that have been funded through the Volkswagen program. And this doesn't include a lot of propane school buses that we did fund uh, through the DERA, DERA program prior to Volkswagen. So significantly more than 191 total actually. And I think one of the things here that's really you know worth noting is you know, you look at school systems like those here in Indianapolis with Wayne Township, Warren Township, Lawrence, Lawrence Township. I mean, we're, you know, when, when you're willing to dedicate, uh, you know, 31 buses to a transition from diesel to propane, you've got to be comfortable with that transition. It has to make sense for you. So when you look at these pretty large numbers, you can see that there's, there is definitely a level of comfort um, with the transition from diesel to propane school buses. And just kind of wrapping up and in closing again, sort of the same the, the same concept with this slide as the other. I know that there are school systems out there that are contemplating a potential transition to propane. I know that uh, the funding options that Tony is gonna to touch on here shortly uh, provide a lot of money uh, towards electric school buses and a good amount of money towards alternative school buses or alternatively fueled school buses like propane. Um, yeah, as Mike said, these are these are great opportunities to, um, you know, for lack of a better term, you can use somebody else's money to experiment a little bit and see if this is a good transition for you. So with that, I will pass it back to you, Carl. Thanks everybody. Thank, thank you, Sean. Uh, again, as uh, Sean had mentioned, you know, part of uh, the opportunity that we uh, foresee to assist our school corporations throughout our great state of Indiana here is uh, to work uh, through the Green Fleet program where we do fleet assessments, where we can help uh, to, to determine the uh, total cost of ownership for these various um, uh, opportunities. And, and again, that includes looking at the fuel transition, the fuel infrastructure. Um, and again, another point that uh, Sean had made, um, you know, in the uh, several years ago, it, it took us uh, to have to really network with other um, organizations throughout the United States. Uh, we have plenty of deployment 
projects right now in Indiana. Um, the majority of those have been very successful. Uh, so again, as Sean mentioned, uh, you know, please feel free to reach out to your peers, feel uh, free to reach out to us, and we can put you in contact with the administrators, the mechanics, uh, the superintendents, and again, um, you know, this is a, a learning for all of us. And what we want to do as a state is we want to be very transparent on our best management practices. And again, that is the opportunity for you to work with us because we will share all those best management practices. So, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Tony Maeda uh, from the US EPA Region 5. Tony, take it away. Thank you, Carl. And uh, it's great everyone in the same shirt. So hi, everybody. I'm Tony from the EPA. Um, when I get into these slides, I just want to, before I do this, um, let everybody know that all except for the very last slide that has my contact information, and you see it there as well, shoot me an email. Um, when I talk about uh, our monthly call, you can send me an email there. All but those last, the very last slide are available already at epa.gov slash clean school bus. And these slides will also be provided to you as well. So you're going to see a lot of links and a lot of information. You don't have to furiously write stuff down. Uh, it will be sent to you so you can see it and click it later. Um, next slide, please. Okay, uh, one more. I'm going to give you all an update on our um, bipartisan infrastructure law clean school bus program, which uh, it is unprecedented. The amount of funding that EPA receives every year for our regular clean diesel program, the Diesel Emission Reduction Act program, the 2022 outlay is currently $92 million nationally. And um, this is $1 billion per year over the next five years, so 2022 through 2026. And um, it is, again, it's it's, to spur the transformation of the nation's fleet of existing diesel vehicles over to uh, cleaner vehicles. Next slide, please. Um, half of this $5 billion, and you know what, let me, I'm sorry, y'all, I'm gonna try to move my lid up, there we go. Uh, half of this funding for the school bus program is directed to go to zero emission school buses. So $2.5 billion is for electric school buses only for the purchase of them. The other half of this funding can be spent on either electric school buses or can be spent on uh, clean, alternatively fueled school buses. Next slide, please. Um, there are benefits to both of these buses. Um, we have seen more, I'm going to talk about the right side really quickly, the alternative fuel buses. Um, they do have reduced emissions to when I mean, you compare them to regular diesel school buses. Um, in a lot of cases here in the Midwest, uh, we do have a lot of fleets that um, have good access to CNG and propane uh, fueling infrastructure, and we do see a fair amount of uh, those those vehicles. And so uh, in this next outlay, which I just gave away, we are going to be funding CNG and propane schools as part of our first uh, rebate offering. Um, but for, for electric school buses on the left side here, you know, you take away the, uh, the, the tailpipe and there are zero emissions from the bus. And you know there are going to be emissions created from the grid, and you know there's a there's a mix of different energies. Actually, Indiana has a lot of of windmills and and a good diverse mix of energy. And you know the United States is moving over time uh, away from um, just the the less efficient coal uh, boiler generation of electricity to more efficient coal and other sources of uh, electrical generation. So the other key thing is that when you are driving or, or a passenger on a diesel vehicle uh, the closer you are to that that engine and that tailpipe the more uh, exposed you are to those emissions and so you're really just eliminating uh, the exposure from that bus to the children that are on the bus and to the maintenance folks who maintain the buses in those garages and to the drivers that drive them every day next slide please so we have three options, funding options for this program. And their EPA is going to exercise our ability to run all three different programs. Um, we are able to spend this $5 billion through a grant program, a competitive grant program, which there's no details on other than EPA does expect to open some sort of bipartisan infrastructure law school bus grant program in the fall. So this is a, a hazy future for us right here. There is a mechanism for EPA to contract directly with entities and spend this funding, which EPA has done contracts before on a much smaller scale. So they're exploring that 
we're thinking if they do anything, it might be next year. So that's even even more hazy distant future. But sometime later this month, it was supposed to be this week. Uh, we learned um, on Tuesday at our our weekly planning calls because I'm part of the group that plans helps shape the the program. You know, they put input from folks like myself in the regional offices and definitely headquarters too. Um, the program was supposed to open this week, so I thought I would showing up with like a hey you've seen it open already um right now they're they're thinking of may 20th as the new tentative date um they're thinking of having a public opening event on that date um it, it, it is subject to change because it's already changed twice already um but soon like hopefully this month there's going to be a rebate program it is the fastest way for us to to outlay funding to folks um when you can apply for competitive grants some of the people on this uh, webinar have been and are uh, competitive grant awardees. It's a pretty big process. Um, it's not just, hey, we want to do X, Y, and Z, so give us the funding. Like there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of funding documentation, there's a lot of certification, a lot of signing of forms, a lot of back and forth and amending them. And, and that is a lengthy process for everybody involved. Um, this is the quickest way for folks to get that funding. It's very straightforward. Uh, if you basically, when you apply, it's going to be an online application process. So we're going to that last little piece there. Um, it's it's all going to be online. There's no paper, physical paper component to it. Um, we've actually had folks in our office test the. They've given us like a link to like try to apply, you know, as a as a dummy school to just see the application process, see how it goes. You can start the application, and if you get stuck or you got to go and find more information or you just have to, you know, end your day. You can stop the application, it saves it for you. You can come back to it later and, and start you know, start from where you left off. Um, so this is this is the most straightforward way that we have seen for schools, school districts to apply for this funding. Um, and like I said at the bottom bit, there's going to be some sort of um, competitive diesel program later this fall. And then, you know, maybe in the winter time, but more likely sometime next year, they'll have uh, a a contract mechanism. So not a lot of information about those we're going to focus on the rebate program right now so next slide please so the first outlay that'll happen later this month most tentatively will be for at least 500 million dollars um for the 2022 clean school bus rebate program and that will be for again at least half of this funding has to go to zero emission so electric school buses uh, but the other half can go to electric or propane or compressed natural gas school buses. So school districts that apply can submit one application, but you can apply for up to 25 buses. And as you're gonna see uh, when I get into this funding table in a little bit, if you are a priority school and you have 25 class seven or eight school buses that you want to replace with electric school buses, and then you add in the charger uh, funding that you're, I'm gonna talk about as well, you'd be looking at around like $10 million um, in rebates just for one school district. So next slide, please. Uh, this is a very tentative timeline and this the slides that I'm giving were actually presented last month. So that gives you a little flavor of how sort of stagnant this information kind of is, but the months are, are, are just barely current right now. So um, again, they were gonna, headquarters is gonna try to open this program um, this week but may is still the target date for opening the rebate program and again we're thinking now uh it was gonna actually be i think today but it, it's we're looking at may 20th for some sort of opening event um the the program will be open for three months so you don't there's no benefit to being the first to apply it's not a first come first serve they're going to gather all the applications then we're going to review them and make sure which ones are actually eligible and then they go and do the selection process so you don't have to rush to do this you've got time um you know but do it sooner than than later is is the thing too don't forget about it um we'll start reviewing those uh those applications for their eligibility just to make sure that you know the buses meet the criteria and the schools and the applicants whatever the application uh the applicant organization is that they're all eligible and whatnot um, we will try to notify schools by October um, and then payment request forms. So I'm going to get into this a little bit later, but essentially it'll be, you get um, six months to work out the, uh, 
six months to get the purchase order for the for the new school buses and if you have electric school buses for the new school buses plus the chargers and then this bottom line here it's going to be two years for schools to uh, submit to epa their closeout documentation which will be hey we got the new buses we've either and as i'm going to get into this we have either destroyed or we've donated or we've sold the old buses and then you know so you finish that whole thing two years allows for you know we've we've heard that there are product we, we know that there are product plays because we've seen them in our grants across the board not just on school buses but on all, everything these days um so there's some time hopefully enough time built in um for the product delays to occur and folks to get these buses but then also some time for people to get used to the newer technology and have those diesel buses as sort of like a backup um, so you can fall back to them if you need to if something happens um, which hopefully will not um, but that that sort of learning the new technology and transitioning away from the old technology time is is baked into that two years as well so next slide please the eligible applicants for this program there's four different categories uh, primarily it's state and local government entities responsible for providing bus service to one or more public school systems or that uh, are responsible for the purchase of school buses. So you're looking at school districts, um, but you could also have, um, if it's like the, the county buys the buses, they could be eligible, uh, or the township buys the buses, they could be eligible, um, you know, but it, it should be the local state, you know, again, the state buys the bus, that they could be eligible as well. Um, but if you fit that category, you know, it's primarily the school district and, and local government entities that, you know, are tied to that school district. Going to the right side, the nonprofit school transportation associations. So like National School Transportation Association comes to mind because they're they are currently an EPA grantee, but they are a nonprofit school transportation association. So groups like that. Um, bottom left corner, so tribes, uh, tribal organizations, tribally controlled schools uh, are a priority group and an eligible applicant. And then in the bottom right corner, so it says eligible contractors. And you would think that that means contracted school bus providers, but because Congress wrote this infrastructure law, it doesn't mean that. Uh, it means it means something else, and I'm gonna get into that, but primarily what eligible contractors are, are, are vendors, um, you know, dealerships, basically entities that sell buses and entities that make the buses. So manufacturers and vendors, for some weird reason, are considered eligible contractors. Um, but I'm gonna get into a way, next slide, please. I'm gonna talk about, as we get in on here, how um, contracted school bus providers are able to be part of this. Um, it just takes a little bit more you know, coordination. So for the state and local government entities, um, you know, this includes public school districts. Um, US territories are, are included in geographic distribution. Um, we don't really have any of those in the Midwest. Public charter schools with an NCES district ID are eligible to apply directly for this funding. Um, most state governmental entities would not be eligible to, to apply, but some, like South Carolina, own bus fleets and would be eligible. So that's where that state uh, portion of the state and local entities comes in. Next slide, please. So for the tribes, um, we do have a number of tribes in the Midwest. I'm not sure if there are any in Indiana, but um, there are surrounding us. Um, and we, my office deals with uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Uh, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. So um, we do have a fair amount of tribes. We've been reaching out separately uh, to those tribes. But the one thing I did want to talk about here too is that um, when we get into prioritization, actually, I'll mention it again, but tribal schools are a priority group, but also schools that um, receive funding. And it's specified in a later slide, but folks who get funding, uh, tribal funding, because they have tribal students coming to their school. So non-tribal schools that receive and get funding for tribal students are also a priority school. So next slide, please. Yep, again, in the nonprofit school associations, so like you're, you're kind of like your NSTA folks, trade associations, membership associations in the student transportation industry. Next slide, please. So here's that eligible contractors again and you know it's a little bit more explanation of it, it's basically like the bus dealers and oems meet these criteria and for some reason it's just like how it's the definition of contractor in congress's mind when they wrote this bill um so i'm gonna next slide please for the eligible contractors yeah so private school bus fleets which would be like you know we have heard and i i, I you know there are the 
they've come up with a name here like big yellow bus sales and safety first bus company. So safety first bus company can apply by themselves, but safety first can, can partner with either the bus dealer, which would be like, you know, yellow bus sales. Um, you have to make sure that you serve a specific school district. The school district can also apply on behalf of the contracted school bus provider. And frankly, I think that's a more straightforward application process but I'm going to get into it in the next few slides here, but I want to stay here for one second just to say that. So you can either have the eligible contractor apply or you could have the school district that this fleet serves. No matter what scenario you do, um, you have to make sure that you don't have to sign the contract because we do understand that contracts aren't, they're usually annual, most cases, a lot of cases, um, but you have to be sure that the school understands and the, the contract provider understands that they should serve the district for at least five years. Um, because that, again, we want those buses to get the reductions in the area that are applied for and not just be like driven somewhere else. So next slide, please. Um, this is the first scenario. And, and, and again, like for, for eligible contractors, this is, this is how actual contracted school bus companies can apply. There's two different ways. I think this is the more complicated way, but it's the first way that uh, headquarters came up with. So you have the, in the green box is the eligible contractor, so it's the, the dealer of those buses. They have, and, and honestly, in either one of these scenarios, no matter what happens, if you have a contractor, I mean, you're gonna want, the school's gonna know, the contractor's gonna have to talk to the school and they're, they're all gonna have to work with a vendor to buy the buses anyway. So at any rate, this does force you to start that conversation ahead of time, um, but everyone's gonna have to have this talk no matter what you do. Um, so this coordination is, is, is going to have to happen anyway but you have the contractor apply on behalf of the school bus company that serves a specific school and and again they have to make sure that they serve that school district for at least five years if they're selected and that that bus company um you know will show that they do serve that specific school district that all meet the eligibility criteria so those the bus company has to have eligible school buses which i will get into in a few slides and that school district has to be you know uh well a school district, an eligible applicant, um, you know, and also if they're a priority school, that that we'll get into that too. That kind of raises the amount of money they get. So the next slide, please. I think this is the cleaner scenario where you just have the school district that's served by the contracted school bus company apply on the school bus company's behalf. And you know, there's a lot fewer boxes and arrows and stuff in this one, so um, it is cleaner. Uh, but again, you just have to make sure that that private fleet would, they would replace or, you know, again, we're going to get into you replace or donate or sell your bus depending on its age. Um, and they have to serve that school for five years. Um, it, the, the exact specifics of how, you know, the five year serving certification and yeah, we serve the school. All I can say is that um, I have not tried the test run because I just haven't had time yet to, to apply and to be able to tell you firsthand what the application process looks like. But I do know it's all electronic for everybody. So nobody, you know, everybody who applies is gonna do the same thing online. For past, for the DERA rebate programs in the past, it was a checkbox where you certify and you sign your name and say, yes, we serve this school district and yes, we're gonna be serving them for five years. So I believe it will be like some sort of certification process where you just say, you know, you vouch for the fact that you will do that. So next slide, please. Um, there are prioritized applicants for this program, and those applicants, it, it's built into law, it lets us, lets us do this because EPA has priorities, and that is to reduce, to maximize the reduction in exposure of diesel emissions. And to us, that means, you know, going after places where there are large areas of diesel activity, um, also where there are a large amount, more amounts of people that are exposed to those uh, diesel engines, and then the Biden administration has the Justice 40 initiative, which directs EPA and our clean diesel program is part of that. So this is part of that program, uh, directs us to um, spend at least 40% of our funding in areas, uh, environmental justice areas and areas of disparate, um, areas that are disproportionately affected by uh, air quality issues. So, um, applicants that request these funds that meet any of these prioritization criteria are gonna get more money and they'll receive preference in the selection process. Um, 
generally what that preference would mean is that there will be all the eligible applicants and they it goes through a random number generator so it's not like somebody like throwing a dart or something like that or somebody you know grabbing somebody out of a hat or, or even worse like somebody saying no that's cool no that's cool it's random um but then when that list happens you know the i think what they do is they go through the priority schools maybe first um or yeah that that part isn't totally clear but there is some sort of preference in that selection process whether they get picked first or you know and they get more money um and it, and you know the the full details again aren't in all of our hands so we don't have the program guide yet so i cannot really say how this prioritization actually works but it's there just know that it's there so if you meet one of those criteria you're more you're more likely to receive the uh the rebate than a school that's not on this prioritization criteria so uh, we offer equal prioritization for school districts that meet one or more so if you are in one metric you have a priority metric you're in that priority group there's not like well now i have twice the priority because i have two of them it's just your priority or not um there is a prioritized funding list and what i can say is we've seen a preview of this list i cannot give you details really good deal like what schools are on it um because the list is not final it will be available to the public the day that the program opens so unfortunately i can't share this with you until it opens but what i will say is that um rachel on our clean diesel team she counted yesterday how many school districts are in each state in our region and to give you a sense of how much larger this list is than the american rescue plan last year last year uh, for any schools that are, are aware of last year's ARP funding, um, we put out a priority schools list for that. And there were five schools in Indiana, I believe, um, on that list. And this year, there are 124 school districts on the priority list. And in our Region 5 states, again, there are six states in Region 5, there are 1,431 schools in the priority districts. School, I'm sorry, 1,431 priority school districts in our list. And again, 124 of those are in Indiana. So um, if those schools, once you see that list for IDEM and for Drive Clean Indiana and for schools that are on this, epa.gov slash clean school bus, May 20th when that thing opens or whatever day it opens, check the list. And if you're on it, you should definitely apply. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we come up with this priority school list? And it's the uh, small area income and poverty estimates for 2020. So if the school has 20% or more students living in poverty, according to that metric, that's how they get on the list. If you are not listed in that data, um, most charter schools that aren't, you can self-certify as having 20% more uh, students living in poverty, EPA will probably ask you for some documentation to Prove that. So don't lie and just say, hey, yeah, we have 20% or more. If you don't, they're going to check. So, um, but you, if you're not on that list, it doesn't mean that you're not a priority school. Uh, it just means that it's for that specific year, for that specific metric, school either has no data or wasn't there on the list. But if you can show EPA that you do have 20% or more students living in poverty, um, and you can make that case, you can get added to that list. So part of that is why there's that three month period. Um, so I would say, you know, you don't have to apply first. You should check everything and start looking at the application process right when this opens. The other cohort of prioritization is rural school districts. So that is districts uh, codes 43 rural remote and code 42 rural dis distant um, by the National Center for Education Statistics. And then finally, tribal school districts. That's what I was talking about before. Uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs funded school districts and school districts that receive basic support payments for children who reside on Indian land. So tribal schools and schools that have funding because they have tribal students uh, on their schools. So next slide, please. The replacement guidelines. So you're going to have to replace, you have to have a 2010 or older diesel powered bus to apply. And if the 2010 or older diesel powered buses that you're going to replace with EV or all fuel buses, you got to scrap that 2010 or older bus. And that means drilling a hole or cutting a hole in the engine block and then cutting the chassis in half so that it can't be used as a bus. You can take all the upfit, you can sell the seats, you could reuse the seats. If there's any like, you know, a nice stereo in there, you can keep that moving on. Um, all Everything else but the engine and the chassis have to be disabled. If you don't have any 2010 or older diesel buses um, and you're requesting a zero emission school bus replacements, 
you can either scrap the 2010 or older non-diesel buses, so gasoline buses or CNG or all fuel buses that you may have that are older than 2010, so they've been around a while, you can scrap those. If you don't have any 2010 or older combustion engine vehicles, you can scrap, sell, or donate your 2011 or newer uh, internal combustion engine bus. So that kind of we heard a lot and you know, regional folks like myself, my coworkers in other regions did say, hey, you know, the, the diesel emission, the DIRA funding that we have, the legislation tells us that we have to turn over the fleet. And turning over the US fleet means destroying the older vehicles, like you're actually getting the improvement and the average age of vehicles gets newer with each action that we take. Um, this, there's not any language like that in the bipartisan infrastructure law. So there isn't really like everything has to have a replacement and a destruction component. And newer buses that are still pretty good and still meet new emission standards, uh, they're still pretty clean. Why should we have to destroy them? Maybe they would serve better being run by a school that couldn't afford that bus brand new, but can buy it used and get a better deal than buying something like really old. So that's kind of the thinking in that process. Next slide. The eligible buses have to have a, a GVWR of 10,001 pounds or more. They have to be operational. They can't just be like sitting on the property, you know, on, on cinder blocks. Uh, they have to be owned by the fleet receiving the replacement bus. And then that those buses, eligible buses have to service the school district for at least three days a week on average during the 21, 2022 school year at time of applying. So they have to be the more in use buses. And ideally they're the buses that drive routes every day for kids to go back and forth, but at least three days a week, not like the bus you take once a month for field trips or something like that. Next slide. So the new buses again have to be uh, battery electric, compressed natural gas or propane, 2021 or newer uh, model year if you're going CNG or propane. It, they have to be again 10,001 pounds gross vehicle weight rating or more. You can't order them before you get selected for the funding. So we're not going to pay you for something you already did. You have to be selected and get that letter and then you can go and order the bus. You have to buy them. You can't lease them or do a lease to own. Um, leasing is something that we're trying to work with for the last couple of years. Um, you may see a lease thing maybe in a few years. I maybe wouldn't put a lot of eggs in that basket, but um, we're, we've been hearing for folks that do lease pieces of equipment. This really does mean more for like, um, you know, port, port uh, loading yards and drayage and stuff like that, not as much for school buses. But again, you have to buy it. So next slide, please. Uh, you got to serve it again for five years. They have to meet all the, you know, standards. You can't have an unvented diesel passenger heater in the bus. We're trying to figure out whether it means you can't have any passenger heater at all or not. Um, they use the word unvented, so that suggests that there could be other forms of diesel heaters that could be involved, but stay tuned for a better answer on that. I don't have one today. Uh, you cannot use other federal funds um, to, to uh, augment the purchase of this stuff. You can use state or local funds, but just not other federal funds. And then lastly, um, keep your documentation if you get selected because for at least five years, because um, there will be spot checks from auditors and you don't want someone knocking at your door saying, hey, show me how you bought this bus. If you don't have any documentation, it'll be a bad day. So next slide. Here's the uh, funding chart. And this kind of gives you a flavor and I'll, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but um, just kind of give you a sense. So for CNG and propane, as you can see, if you're a priority school for class seven, eight buses for compressed natural gas, priority school gets $45,000 per bus and a non-priority school will get $30,000. And it's less, you know, if you go down to smaller classes. For propane, if you're priority school, you get $30,000 per bus. If you're a non-priority school, you get $20,000 per bus for class seven and eight and then a little bit less for the smaller classes. So then going to the left side of this table, the electric buses, for class seven and eight buses, uh, if you're a priority school, you can get up to $375,000 per electric bus. And if you're non-priority school, it's up to $250,000 per electric bus. And it's a little bit less um, when you're looking at the smaller classes of buses. Um, the thing is, and again, any cost above this funding um, are going to be uh, borne by the applicant. However, we think that, you know, having looked at the prices of electric buses, if you're buying class seven or eight EV bus, 
$375,000 should get you a pretty good bus. It's not going to get you the greatest bus out there, like the most bells and whistles, um, but it'll get you some and more than just like a basic school bus is our understanding. So it's, it's pretty generous. Um, you know, if it costs less than 375, we're not going to give you more than the cost of the bus, but up to $375,000. So next slide, please. So for the infrastructure funding, and uh, I want to be very careful here, and you'll see this in another slide coming up, um, up to $20,000 per bus for a charger uh, for priority schools. And for schools that are not priority schools, uh, you can get up to $13,000 per bus per charger. And again, um, if the charger costs less, you know, you only get the cost of the charger, but you can get up to this funding and it's per bus. Um, but I want to be kind of clear on what infrastructure means. So next slide, please. That's a red line and it should be a non-dotted, it should be a bright red line. Um, take note of the red line. And this is something that we are trying to work with our MCDI call, which is on my last slide. Um, so the 20,000 or $13,000 per bus ends between the electric panel and the electric meter. So really it's, our DERA funding says you can upgrade wires, our, our regular DERA funding says you can upgrade the wires and stuff that are on your property, but this is even more narrow with this bipartisan funding, the infrastructure law funding. So this mentally put this slide in your brain. Um, for the funding on the left side, the non-eligible stuff for rural, for even you know smaller urban areas, we've heard from utilities that there could be upgrades to like substations and things. So there will be additional costs that because we don't want to trigger the uh, there's a Buy America funding provision. I, I'm, I'm I'm I have I don't want to go too long here, but Buy America says hey you know and it's it's good. It says we should we should buy United States products for the United States. Um, the only issue is that we are in a pretty global economy these days, and so not every part is manufactured in the United States. Maybe they're assembled here or assembled somewhere else and brought here um, by companies that, all, that do exist in the United States, but just aren't totally made here. It is, a very, um, it is a very deep web of uh, administrative check boxes that EPA is trying to work through. So we said, hey, instead of delaying this for years, because for anybody who's familiar with the congestion mitigation air quality funding from the Department of Transportation, they will tell you that you know CMAC funding has been delayed for a long, for like five years or more on projects because of this Buy America provision. We said, hey, you know, we'll just get the money out the door. So it's up to 20 grand just for the narrow, the charger, anything to get, you know, the electric panel upgrade. But unfortunately, anything beyond that, you know, we're trying to, to partner with utilities and other groups to make this as easy as possible. Um, you know, and to make it as headache free. So we're working on, you know, where can this other funding come from? Or they're, you know, trying to find opportunities for folks to, to get funding there. We're trying to put everybody in touch with utilities. And I know Indiana does a pretty good job of communicating with the utilities on this funding through VW. So hopefully it'll be smoother in your state than in other states. Um, I think the fact that this webinar exists is kind of helpful that folks are already doing this planning. So uh, next slide, please. So to apply, you have to have an active SAM, System for Award Management, SAM.gov entity registration. And I just want to harp, the key thing here is that SAM.gov is the mechanism that EPA uses. We use SAM as the pass-through mechanism for the funding. Um, so you have to be registered there. And, and if, if you're not, as soon as you hang up on this, go there now. Um, in the past, even if you're an existing member, they moved from the Dunn's number, the Dunn and Bradstreet number, to this unique entity ID that SAM.gov gives you. And for 2022, you have to have your UEI in order to be able to apply for this. So if you haven't been on SAM.gov, make sure that you're active. If you haven't been on it in a while, go now as soon as this thing is done and make sure you, A, that you're registered, B, that you're up to date and you're active registered because it does expire or like lapse. And then third is that you have that UEI. And then you have to get your points of contact in there. and um, the last thing I'll say is email. Oh yeah, there's going to be another slide about SAM, so I'm going to I'm going to go back to SAM.gov. But make sure that you have all the contacts that are required for SAM.gov in place as well. And there's going to be a list of those in a future slide. Um, one thing I'll say: if you have questions about the application process, send questions to cleanschoolbus at epa.gov. It'll be responded to directly to you. 
but then they'll also put your question and the answer in a Q&A document that anybody can read. So even before you ask, or ask your question, check that Q&A document because someone might have already asked it and your answer might be there already. Um, and again, there'll be a three month period for applications. So next slide. Yeah, here's the thing. On the right hand side, make sure you have those four contacts because you're going to have to have them listed. You're going to need to be able to state them in the application process. And so get them in place now and check to make sure that you have those in place and the people still work at your organization and those emails aren't just going nowhere. So just make sure you have that. And again, as soon as it is done, go there. EPA does not run this. I'm a friendly guy. I don't I can't vouch for them because they don't work for EPA. They're their own organization. I do know that it takes a couple days sometimes more to resolve issues and they're going to get a crush of people applying so you you should go now next slide please um yeah so like i said there's a random number generated like nobody's like picking these out or there's no you know crafty way of doing it it's literally just random um we're going to go from the top to the bottom of the list till the funding is is gone epa may add more money than 500 million if we see a huge crush of applications um, we are going to select at least one application per state and territory. Um, and then lastly, folks who aren't selected, you're going to remain on a wait list. And I think that's if they had dump additional funds, then they'll go down that list. So you may not, you don't get selected right away. Don't fret. First off, there's going to be four more years of this and several more opportunities, not just this rebate, but there's going to be grants, there's going to be contracts, rebate, grant, contract. That cycle is going to go for another few years. Um, but then you'll also be on this wait list. So next slide, please. Uh, yeah, like I said, you get 60 days um, to, well, we will notify you within 60 days, is what this slide is saying. Um, and we'll tell you if you've been selected, how much money you're going to get, and how to proceed. Um, some schools may have already gotten emails from me, because I do work with schools on the DERA rebate program. So it'll, be, it'll look similar to that if you're familiar with the rebate program. Um, payment request form is due within six months for your buses and, and chargers. Um, again, this is to say that we do realize there's going to be delays, so we're conscious of that. And if you realize you're going to experience a delay, let us know as soon as you know. Next slide. Um, and I'm just kind of kind of breeze through these last ones. You get two years, like for the reason that I said, scrapping, disabling, um, donating, selling your old buses, whatever you do. So just making sure you complete all your actions and you have all your documentation there. And then you could submit that to us after two years. And, and again, it bakes in a little bit of time for, um, for transitioning to the new buses and getting the new buses too. So next slide, please. So lastly, again, all the things that I've kind of hit on, um, that bottom bullet points, the bottom two, maybe, you know, we may move this May, August may not be the exact month, but, you know, soon, I guess, is the, is the, uh, is the thing there. And then last slide, please. Oh, no, this isn't the last slide. But so here's the second to last slide. Go to epa.gov slash clean school bus and then clean school bus at epa.gov if you have any questions. You can certainly ask Sean. You can certainly ask Carl. You can ask me as well. Uh, we may punt you to the clean school bus. But then this is my last slide, please. I do want to say I run a monthly call. I had one yesterday. If you're interested in being on it, uh, it's our six states plus EPA region seven. So it's like Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, and uh, God, Iowa. And so um, several states, we all talk. Um, we try to relay news and things that we've learned in the last month to get people the latest information uh, to kind of coordinate again, because you know the funding ends at that electric panel before the, the panel of the meter. So we got utilities there to try to hear stuff, try to share information. Just let me know, shoot me an email if you'd like to participate. I'm happy to put you on there. And um, sorry, I went a little bit long, but if there's questions, we've got time to answer them and I can stick around later. Sure, Tony. Thank you so much, Tony. L lots of information. Um, we, we do have a couple questions. Again, if you could just type in your questions uh, to the uh, response and we'll, we'll get to those. Uh, but one of the questions uh, that, that came up, Tony, was uh, reimbursement, cash flow. So again, with uh, school corporations, they're looking at uh, applying for this funding and uh, they are hypothetically awarded this funding. What, what will be the process? How long will that take to get a reimbursement? Uh, so does the school district have to pay uh, for this? And then uh, what would be the reimbursement? Can you go through that just a little bit? That is a good question. You know what? I, I, I failed to mention this because um, EPA is going to provide the funding 
once the purchase order is submitted to us. So you'll get that money to buy the bus. You don't have to front it. Um, in the past, EPA has said, hey, you buy the bus, show us the invoice, and then we give you the rebate on that. So you pay up front and then you get your rebate. That's not the case here. And we think that that will encourage more schools who don't have that funding right now available to get the money and then buy it. And, and again, um, up to $375,000 per electric bus if you're a priority school looking at a class seven or eight. So we hope that there's enough money to encourage schools that don't have the funds, you know, you're gonna get it and you'll have that money to be able to buy the bus uh, or buses. Great, thank you. Um, in regards to infrastructure, um, so hypothetically a school is selected um, and potentially if they wanted to loc, um, does it, is there a determination of where the infrastructure can be located? Say it's not on school property, but uh, hypothetically it could be at a different location. Is that possible? Yeah, and you know, we've, I think the, so I, I think I'm gonna have to owe folks a question there. I think the understanding is that the charters will be at the school or it'll be at a garage where those buses may go. Um, we've heard this because for like specifically for rural districts, the driver drives the bus home at night. So they'd want the charger there to charge the bus. Um, I, I, I would say realistically, it would make sense to be able to allow that charger to be somewhere else. But I mean, honestly, like until the program guide and I will ask this next week, and I apologize, but I'm gonna to have to probably email a response to this group afterwards. Um, okay. Just I'm not sure and I don't wanna give the wrong answer. I would right now just you know assume based on that photo in the slide that you're looking at like somewhere on the school or the maintenance uh, garage property. Very good. But I will get an answer to that, so I apologize. Thank you. Can you talk yep. a little bit about EPA certification? So again, we understand uh, certifications for uh, auto gas, propane, natural gas, and diesel and, and gasoline, but what about electric? Are there certifications? Are, are buses now certified with EPA? There is no engine certification for electric vehicles because they don't have any tailpipe emissions. Very good, very good. <laughs> Uh, again, um, if you have any other additional questions for Michael, for Sean, or for Tony, um, you know, continue to uh, uh, type those into the chat. Um, again, Tony, I know you talked about the Buy America, um, you know, and again, some of the barriers that we've seen across. Um, uh, so, it, are there any provisions for school corporations? Uh, is there um, an approved list of um, buses that are available uh, with EPA that are available. So uh, natural gas buses, propane buses, or electric buses that EPA says, you know, these these are, are considered uh, applicable. I mean, we've seen some new technologies that are basically coming out that are uh, retrofitting of school buses to electric. Yep. And uh, that's where that question comes from. So, yeah. So currently, unfortunately, the bus has to be OEM new and meet that model year. Um, we are looking into, because it is a little bit longer process, it's, I don't, you know, this rebate program that is opening this, hopefully this month, will not have that component, but we hope that a future one will have sort of engine replacement and, you know, take out the diesel engine system, drop in an electric system, drop in a, you know, there are certified kits in some cases. And honestly, like, I know, I know of ones for, construction and off-road purposes. I don't remember off the top of my head if there are certified conversion kits for school buses, but EPA does certify conversion kits. They are not eligible right now uh, under this program. Like it has to be a new model year 2021. So it has to meet the 2021 um, certification standards for, you know, CNG or propane, whatever that, that combustion source is. Tony, Tony, this is Mike LaRocco. Uh, I have heard of a company in New York that is doing, trying to do conversions on school buses, exactly what Carl just asked. And they tried to get their, their model year changed to 2021, but even though the bus was 10 years old already. So there are some out there. Yeah, and that, that's the issue is like what, how, you know, it's like how, how long does the chassis stay good? You could say the bus will give you that because when you have a new vehicle and you recertify it as new, you know, it, new means like the whole thing is going to operate for a certain way for a certain amount of time i think that that's and again it's like a pretty deep question because 
the certification group, um, you know, part of it is in DC, part of it is in um, Ann Arbor where they have the lab where you bring in the, the closed sealed room and you run the thing in the, you can get like literally every admission off it. Um, so there, it, it's a pretty involved process and they are looking into it. And what I would say is Mike, send me that information so that I can forward it to headquarters so they know. I mean, there's a couple companies like, you know, the electric companies like Lion and Orange have already talked to us. Like Thomas has said stuff. There are companies that do these conversions and they're the ones, at least from our, who have talked to us, you know, and said it, um, you know, that, that's the ones we're aware of. So if there are more companies, let me know and I can forward those on. Hopefully my counterpart in our New York office has already done that. Sure. Well, we're um, at the end of the uh, the time frame here. I just wanted to see if uh, Michael or Sean or Tony had any closing thoughts before we close this webinar. None from Mike. Thank you, Mike. None from Sean. I just appreciate all the information and uh, the invitation to participate. Thank you, Sean. And Tony? Check your SAM.gov. Check your SAM.gov and EPA.gov slash clean school bus. Sign up for the newsletter there and you'll get emails directly from headquarters in a very timely manner. Sure. And again, I just want to thank our speakers uh, today. Uh, again, all of us are available. Um, one, one closing thought I will have for you. I know you're all busy. Start now. Let us help you. Um, again, I think what Tony said, we know this funding is coming. coming. Don't wait for the funding to come out. If you're interested, call us today. Uh, get in contact with us today. Uh, start on this opportunity right now. Let us help you take the barriers out of implementing clean school buses here in Indiana. And with that, uh, I'd like to again, thank everyone for attending. Look forward to a great uh, clean school bus year here in Indiana, and we'll have additional webinars uh, coming forward here in the near future. So again, everyone have a great day. Uh, we also have our Drive Clean Indiana annual conference that will be hosted on August 9th. Uh, potentially, you're gonna see these three individuals talking about clean school bus implementation uh, in August and some of our success stories that have happened. So uh, please put that in your schedule. So again, uh, everyone, thank you so much and we look forward to our next webinar. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, everybody.